Okay, I'd like to welcome you all to the uh, Gutenberg Lecture. Um, the first item that we're going to do is our, it's our tradition to, uh, to give uh, the Keiaki Young Scientist Award uh, prior to the, uh, the presentation of the Gutenberg Lecture. So uh, as a first issue, I'm very pleased to present the, uh, the 2018 uh, Kei Aki Young Scientist Award to Ling Ling Ye. Uh, Ling Ling Ye earned her bachelor's degree in geophysics from the University of Science and Technology of China and her master's degree in geophysics from the Institute of Geo Geology and Geophysics, uh, CAS. Um, in 2015, she received her PhD at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Uh, she was the director's postdoctoral fellow at the California Institute of Technology from 2015 to 2018, and she's currently a visiting researcher at the Earthquake Research Institute of the University of Tokyo, uh, and a professor at Sun Yat-sen University, where she is a recipient of a Junior Thousand Talents Plan of China Award. Uh, Dr. Ye's primary research areas are earthquake seismology and seismotectonics. All 37 of her peer-reviewed publications have appeared since 2011. Her PhD research addressed a diverse range of earthquake processes for large, shallow, and deep focus earthquakes, including finite fault slip model inversions of seismic and geodetic data, stress transfer around faults, source parameter scaling, strong ground shaking hazards, and quantification of tectonic processes. A unifying theme of her work has been the energy release of large earthquakes quantified by seismic waves and placed in the context of plate tectonic motions driving earthquake deformation. Her recent directions of research include new efforts in site response characterization, analysis of rupture initiation, and quantification of volcanic earthquake processes. So I'm pleased to present the award to uh, Ling Ling Ye. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm honored to receive this Aki Award and uh, to be placed in such outstanding ranks as those of the past, past uh, awardees. I would not receive this award uh, without many supportive and generous mentors, collaborators, and friends over the years, uh, over whom I can only name a few here. Um, actually, special thanks to, uh, are due to my advisors, Song Lei and uh, Hiro Kalmori. Uh, not only for their incredible patience and excellent supervision for students, but also uh, for infecting me with their patience on science and their love of seismology. I would also like to thank uh, Keith Cooper, Louis Rivera, Emily Borniski, Nadia Laposta, John Philip Awork, Tom Hayden, uh, Victor Tsai, and uh, Kenji Satake for their inspiring collaboration and the generous a generous support of, of my research. I'm grateful for supportive environment uh, at UC Santa Cruz, Sasmo Lab at Caltech, and the Sinyaza University in China, and also many other institutes I have been to. Uh, I feel fortunate to, uh, to, be, uh, to be an observational seismologist with extensive observations available to understand the fundamental phenomena like earthquakes and uh, volcanoes. Uh, of course, thanks to the selfish and open-minded seismology community and uh, advances in observational technique. Uh, it's the beauty of doing science uh, to disentangle complicated observation with simple theory. Uh, personally, I believe that without the definitive observational evidence, geophysics uh, uh, actually, I think, is, uh, it will need nowhere. With exploration of the high quality data, I look forward to getting more understanding about our dynamic arts. Uh, thank you. <laughs> 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 
Well, now we are coming to the, uh, the Gutenberg lecture itself, and I'm pleased to introduce the lecturer for 2018, uh, Bill Ellsworth, who hardly needs uh, uh, an introduction to this audience, I think. Um, Bill got his uh, PhD in the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in 1978. Um, before that, he got a bachelor's degree in Stanford and a master's degree also uh, from Stanford. He served as a geophysicist with the U.S. Geological Survey for, for many years, uh, including uh, the chief of the branch of seismology from uh, 1982 to 1988, uh, and the chief scientist of the earthquake hazards team uh, from 2002 to 2005. Uh, since 2015, uh, he has been a professor uh, at Stanford University, and he's the co-director of the Stanford Center for Induced and Triggered Seismicity. Um, he's received many honors and awards, uh, so the Gutenberg Lecture is just uh, the most recent of many of these awards, uh, including the Meritorious Service Award of the Department of Interior, a Gilbert Fellow of the U.S. Geological Survey, a Fellow of the uh, American Geophysical Union and Distinguished Service Award from the U.S. Uh, Department of Interior. And uh, he also served as the president of the Seismological Society of America from 2007 to 2009. And very recently, of course, Bill has been on the forefront of much of the research uh, in induced seismicity, which is, I think, his topic for today. So I'm pleased to present you uh, Bill Ellsworth, the Gutenberg lecturer. Well, thank you everyone for coming today. Uh, as I said, the screen in this room turns out to be a little bit on the small side. There are still a few good seats in, in front, so if anyone doesn't mind moving forward, please feel free to do so during my talk. So today, um, we're going to be taking, if we can bring the slides up, maybe I can do that. <laughs> This presentation is on a Mac. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> we will get there. <laughs> I'm sorry. Which, uh, which, which one is this? So it's the one on the top. Uh, Ellsworth? Ellsworth Mac, yeah. Always a little bit of an adventure in seismology. It's part of the, it's part of the fun of doing field work that I know many of you are involved in, that things should go well, but you always need to be prepared. So I'm sure we'll get there here in just a minute. Hey, that looks great. Thank you very much. So to get, to get started, um, I'm going to be talking about what I've termed an unintended geophysical experiment on a vast scale. And I think it's probably no surprise to anyone in this world, in this room, that I'm going to be talking about the remarkable rise of seismicity that has occurred in recent years, uh, much of it concentrated in the central United States, or as I sometimes refer to, the, the mid-continent. And I think we all understand now that much of this seismicity is related to new ways that we produce oil and gas and some of the consequences. But it's part of that story that I'd like to bring out today about how we got to our understanding that we are today and to uh, remember some of the important uh, uh, waypoints along that journey. Uh, before starting, I think it's important just to say a few words about the man uh, in whose name this lecture is given to. I think there are probably a couple of people in this room who knew Bino Guten Gutenberg personally. For most of us, uh, we just know him by his reputation, which is, of course, giant. For me, he was probably the preeminent seismologist of the pre-digital era and was fundamentally an observationalist. And it's kind of fun to think about what Gutenberg would have thought of what, was, what, what I'll be talking about today, a fundamental change in the seismicity of the Earth. 
So let me start with a picture that many of you have probably seen before. It's a snapshot of earthquakes in the central United States, uh, in this case covering about a 25-year period from 1973 to 2008. Uh, and during that time, the earthquake activity averaged about 24 or so magnitude 3 earthquakes a year. And there are a number of familiar places on the map here where earthquakes um, are, are well known to occur, such as the New Madras seismic zone, and then kind of a smattering of earthquakes in other parts around the mid-continent. That changed rather suddenly beginning at about 2009, where between 2009 and 2015, more than an order of magnitude increase in the number of earthquakes, 391 on average during that period of time. So something very interesting was going on. And I think you can see from the pattern that there are still some scattered earthquakes that probably represent the tectonic background, but dense concentrations of earthquakes in a number of areas. And when this began, it was a bit of a mystery. We didn't really understand why these earthquakes were happening, and that was the goal, to understand uh, what it was and then to help bring that science forward so that it could be useful in terms of public policy. So it wouldn't be a talk about induced seismicity without showing you some type of a hockey stick plot. And here we're starting at about 2000, and over this period, 2009-11, you can see how things shoot up remarkably. Actually, this is not a count of earthquakes. This is a count of the number of fall AGU presentations <laughs> on induced seismicity. And this has been truly a community effort to get here. Um, I'm out of my curiosity, you won't be filmed, but for those of you who've given a talk that involved induced seismicity during this period of time, would you kindly raise your hand? I know there are many, many hands out there. Well, thank you all. I can't thank you all in terms of your contributions. I'm going to try to identify, at least for me personally, what are some of the high points along the way. And if I don't have a chance to refer to the good work you've done, please uh, bear with me. So I, to step back just a little bit, um, I wanted to show a couple of slides that uh, Justin Rubenstein put together fairly early on in this process that help illustrate what was going on. Um, on the left here, we're going to be looking at some uh, basically decadal snapshots of earthquakes in this same area in the, uh, the mid-continent. And on the right side, we have kind of a modified hockey stick plot where we've reduced the cumulative number of earthquakes by a rate of 21 per year. So as I showed earlier, the, uh, the mid-continent kind of perks along from the 1970s through the early 2000s with a little bit of statistical variation and then things really begin to take off. So that's the thing that we're, we were puzzled by and very and most interested in understanding. So here's 1970 to 1979, 1980 to 1989. Again, New Madrid and other areas show up pretty prominently. Uh, there's a little swarm here in central Arkansas, tectonic earthquakes. Um, 1990 to 1999, same picture. In the, the 2000s, we can see that, um, again, seismicity has now changed in a fundamental way. There's suddenly a bright spot in the center of the state of Oklahoma, bright spots around it, uh, including on the Texas, New Mexico, or on the New Mexico, Colorado border, and elsewhere. So those are the things that we want to take a closer look at. Why is this happening and what can we do about it? Also, at the same time, I'd want to say that because of this concentration of earthquakes in Oklahoma, this is where much of the focus was. And I think we really have to give credit to those who were so instrumental in terms of being able to keep the scientific community on track of what was happening. Austin Holland and his colleagues at the Oklahoma Geological Survey in particular, uh, they were in the middle of the frying pan here and knew how hot it was getting. So I've taken a Google Earth image here and laid on it the earthquakes that occurred during this period of time. Uh, state of Oklahoma doesn't show up very well here, but uh, it kind of has the shape of a pot sitting on a, a hot Texas below, perhaps causing it to boil. Uh, nonetheless, I think you can see that there are some other spots of activity that surround this big bright orange blob in the middle. These are places where uh, individual studies were very, uh, were very soon able to show that these earthquakes occurring in, in unexpected places had some connection to petroleum activity. For example, uh, Greeley, Colorado, just a few earthquakes. This is an injection well that was modified. The earthquake activity went away. Uh, the Raton Basin is one of the areas that I studied with my colleagues at the USGS. Dagger Draw in, um, in uh, New Mexico is again one of these areas where uh, injection-induced seismicity due to water flooding has been long known. Same at Cogdale. 
earthquakes in the Fort Worth Basin that have had many people concerned, strange earthquakes in eastern Texas, and of course the Guy Greenbrier uh, earthquakes in Arkansas. All of these are cases that could be traced back to activity from one or a few wells. And it indicated that by making perturbations in the way that we uh, change pressures or stresses in the subsurface, it wasn't too difficult to induce earthquakes. Of course, the thing we, uh, well, I should mention that um, one of the areas that's not well studied at this point is the Delaware Basin in the, uh, in the westernmost part of the Midland Basin. This is an area that's just lit up in recent years, and it also happens to be the place where the U.S. oil industry on, sh on shore has moved. Uh, there are hundreds of rigs that are active there today, drilling thousands of wells to exploit the shale resources. So our focus today really is going to be on this big orange blob in the middle, which spans most of central Oklahoma going into southern Kansas. And trying to understand uh, the forces that led to this remarkable increase in seismicity uh, that began around 2009. It's hard to get the scale for states, particularly if you're not familiar with them. If you've driven across the state of Oklahoma, you know it takes a hell of a long time to do so. But just to give a little bit of scale here, I uh, stole a picture here from a new, a new um, AGU fellow Mark Simon's paper on the Tohoku earthquake, and we see at the same scale here the rupture area of the Tohoku earthquake. And if I slide this over, it fits pretty well. So we're dealing with an area that's as large as the source dimension of a magnitude 9 earthquake. Thank goodness we've had nothing as large as magnitude 6, but we've had thousands, if, if not maybe tens of thousands, of earthquakes large enough to be felt uh, in the Oklahoma area. Um, I really like this uh, slide from um, uh, Francesco Grigoli that outlays some of the ways in which earthquake, uh, earthquakes can be induced by human activity. Uh, today we're really going to be focusing on the activity that is related to the production of shale oil and shale gas. That isn't to say that we don't have earthquakes related to, say, uh, CO2 uh, sequestration activities or to conventional petroleum uh, exploitation as well, but most of what has happened has been related to technological changes in the way that we get our oil and gas. One reason why natural gas is a, uh, uh, such an affordable uh, commodity at this point, say, compared to coal, and why uh, gasoline doesn't cost any more than it does at the pump these days. There are two mechanisms, I think, that are now widely understood as being uh, responsible for uh, producing changes in the effective stress balance in the earth that can trigger earthquakes. On the left of this slide is the uh, pore pressure diffusion model in which a connection between an area with elevated pressure is able to transmit that pressure to a fault. If that fault is critically, uh, is appropriately oriented in the stress field and the stresses are high enough, a small perturbation can be enough to nucleate an earthquake. The other mechanism doesn't require a connection. It really relies on the poor elastic changes that will occur uh, due to uh, ch changes of volume in the subsurface. And I think by now it's really uh, clear, I'm sure, to everyone in this room that, that the, uh, the Earth is near a critical state in terms of the stress balance between the strength of faults and the stress conditions so that a small perturbation is uh, sufficient to nucleate earthquakes, at least small ones. Well, before talking about the large-scale experiment, I thought it'd be worthwhile going back in time a little bit to talk about the first uh, well-documented, unintended geophysical experiment on a small scale. And of course, this would be the Rocky Mountain Arsenal in uh, near Denver, Colorado. Uh, this is a site in which the uh, Department of en Energy had drilled a deep well into the basement. Uh, they found a quite conductive zone in which they could uh, park some rather dangerous fluids. And what they didn't realize was that they had drilled into a Precambrian fault zone. So the, the permeability that still persisted over geologic time allowed them to put large volumes of fluid in the ground. And there was a clear correlation uh, that was discovered between the uh, injection of fluids and the occurrence of earthquakes. Now, it took a number of years, actually, to make that connection. Earthquake locations were very difficult. There weren't many stations. But after a detailed study by the USGS, they, they found that the earthquakes occurred uh, within this single fault zone. And, and of course, one of the key things about the, the Rocky Mountain experience was that they terminated injection in 1966, but it was about a year later when the largest earthquakes occurred, the largest just about magnitude 5. So already telling us something about the importance of diffusion uh, in the process.
And I would also point out that from these higher resolution locations, it was clear that by 1967, earthquakes were occurring up to 10 kilometers from the injection point. So from very early evidence, we, we, should, we should have known and remembered, perhaps rem remembered is the right word, that these fluid pressure perturbations can be transmitted over long distances if the permeability of the structure of the earth is, is appropriate. Fortunately, these earthquakes died off as, uh, since injection was terminated, although some of them continued as late as the 1980s. Another unintended geophysical experiment on a small scale took place in Rangeley, Colorado. This is not the famous experiment that I'll talk about in a minute, but this is the consequence of water flooding in the Rangeley anticlinal field. So range, the field here lies basically on the western border of, of Colorado, and my colleagues at the USGS analyzed the seismograms recorded about 100 kilometers away at the UBO uh, array, which was put in for test band monitoring. They could go back to 1962, and over that period of time, they found that there was a clear correlation between the earthquakes occurring in the Rangeley field and the injection of water into the Rangeley anticline. Pretty interesting stuff. Now, they weren't doing this experiment uh, for uh, lack of a good reason. In fact, the good reason was Jack Haley and, and Barry Raleigh thinking about what we might do to make some earthquakes. And so they got the idea that why don't we go to Rangeley Let's get permission from the operator, ask them if we could borrow a couple of their oil wells for half of a decade and make some earthquakes. Remarkably, <laughs> the operator agreed. <laughs> and we have the Rangeley experiment that I'm sure all of you have, have heard about. And the basic idea was to test the effective stress law. Uh, Jim Byerly measured the friction of the rocks in the Weber sandstone in his laboratory, so we knew what the coefficient of friction was. Uh, Barry and Jack measured the stresses underground, uh, so we knew what the state of stress was. John Bredehoff developed a hydrologic model, and so all of the ingredients were there to test the effective stress relationship. And they found that when the pressure was high enough, according to the theory, the earthquakes were plentiful, and when they turned on the, the pumps to lower the pressure, the earthquakes stopped almost immediately. I think one of the other important lessons from this particular experiment is that the permeability to fluid flow along a fault is sufficiently large that adjustment of fluid pressure in the fault follows rapidly upon changes in fluid pressure at the experimental wells. Now that's a quote from their science paper. And what it was saying basically was that there are conductive pathways in the earth and they allow fluid pressure to be communicated over large distances very quickly. So when they turned off the pumps, not only did the earthquakes uh, cease very rapidly beneath the injection wells, but also those earthquakes that were occurring in the basement. So let's come back to Oklahoma. Uh, this is an area that has some natural seismicity, but nothing like this has ever happened in the past. I can speak personally for about 18 years because I was born and raised in Oklahoma, and I can tell you we never felt earthquakes, we never talked about them. So this is something truly new that was happening. So what was really happening is a change in the way that oil is being extracted, oil and gas are being extracted from the ground. Oklahoma has a history of petroleum production that goes back more than a century, and the, the production was from conventional oil fields. This began to change in the late 1990s as two technologies were developed. One was hydraulic fracturing, and the second was the ability to drill extended reach horizontal wells. This allowed source rocks, impermeable shales to be tapped and exploited. So this cartoon uh, shows in the general picture here that we have a shale layer uh, which will drill wells into extended reach horizontal wells and then stimulate those wells by hydraulic fracturing. Of course, hydraulic fracturing involves raising the pressure very quickly to a high value to create new fractures, to create permeable pathways for the extraction of the product. Now, in many areas, such as Pennsylvania, where gas is being produced, you pretty much just get gas out of the well. That's great. But in Oklahoma, these beds are very wet. So for every gallon of water, or for every gallon of oil that you pull out of the ground, you get about 10 gallons of water. What do you do with the water? Well, it's three times as saline as the ocean. It contains heavy metals. Uh, bromide, all sorts of things. Really, the only thing you can do with it that is economically feasible is to put it underground. Uh, 
And in this part of the world, the best place to park the oil or the water is in what we call the Arbuckle Group. This is a, uh, a series of primarily karstic limestones that sits directly upon basement. Uh, it's a great place to dispose of fluid because it accepts the fluid very easily. In fact, it accepts it under gravity feed. They only pressurize the pumps in general because they want to get more product in, in the ground. The other thing I should say about the Arbuckle Formation is that it's under pressured. So if you drill a well into the Arbuckle, you'll find that the water level is sitting hundreds of feet below the ground level. Because they never bring the pressure, the, the water level to the surface, it puts a, a real clear bound upon how much the pressure can be raised in the Arbuckle formation. And as we'll see, it's not very much. So from there, the idea is that we pressurized, at least at a low degree, this Arbuckle disposal formation. And from there, that pressure can diffuse and it can diffuse into the basement, which is generally impermeable, but it may go faster if it runs into a permeable pathway. Raise that pressure high enough and it's possible to nucleate an earthquake. So there are really two different industrial drivers that we're looking at here that are related to the seismicity. On the left, we have the industrial driver that's related to hydraulic fracturing. Uh, this is a massive, um, industrial operation. If you've ever seen one of an, a hydraulic fracturing operation uh, in progress, it is really quite impressive. Scores of trucks to not only develop the, uh, the pressures necessary to fracture the rock, but trucks that will contain the fluid and the slurries that they put in to keep fractures opening. It's a short-term process, however, uh, one that can say take a week or two to stimulate a typical well. And from our experience, the seismicity will generally die off uh, perhaps following an Amori-type decay within a matter of a few weeks. And to the, the, the alternative is, of course, the long-term uh, disposal of fluids at much lower pressure, but very large volumes uh, from wastewater into the basal formation. So let me say a few words about fracking. Um, it is a source of earthquakes. Uh, we see earthquakes in Oklahoma today that are related to fracking. They're currently developing parts of the state where water is relatively scarce. And uh, now that people are watching carefully, they have a, a traffic light system that raises concern if the earthquakes get as large as magnitude two and a half or so. It's been a more of a concern north of the border in Canada where fracking induced earthquakes have gone into the mid magnitude four range. So there is certainly a hazard potential which is related to fracking. But in general, it is a short-term operation, one that has uh, created nuisance earthquakes, and those large enough to be uh, potentially hazardous in Canada have largely been in, in unpopulated areas. So, so far, so good. We should knock on wood. In contrast, uh, the disposal of these vast volumes of wastewater in uh, the state of Oklahoma and southern uh, Kansas has involved hundreds of deep wastewater disposal wells. So the little triangles on this diagram represent the locations of something like 900 deep wells that have been disposing water into uh, the Arbuckle. So we've been raising the pressure in this basal formation very systematically in both space and time. And it was really the understanding of the evolution of the seismicity and its relationship to injection which broke this problem wide open. So let me begin with where I think the initial discovery was made. This is a figure from uh, Katie Karanen's paper in Science Magazine published in, in 2014. Uh, this was an extremely important result, being able to help us understand why seismicity was occurring in an area called Jones. Now the interesting thing about Jones is that if you were to go to Google Earth and look for the oil field activity, there's either earthquakes, it's not a, you wouldn't find anything. There aren't pump jacks, there aren't well pads, there aren't disposal wells. It's about the only place in Oklahoma I've ever seen where there aren't oil wells. And nonetheless, that's where the earthquakes were happening. What was happening though was that there was large scale disposal that was occurring uh, to the side at distances of about 20 kilometers away from the wells. Some extremely long wells, uh, large disposal wells here just to the east of Oklahoma City. And so Katie working with uh, man, Matt Weingarten who was at the time Shemingo's uh, graduate student and Jeff Abers and Barbara Beacons decided to take a quantitative look at this. Was there a potential connection that they could make uh, 
between the occurrence of these earthquakes and the disposal activities. And they did this by developing a very simple, poral, uh, very simple hydrologic model, uh, just simply solving uh, the Laplace equation, in which they had a relatively permeable arbuckle layer in which the water was being disposed, so pressures rising just simply by the addition of the, the fluid, and then a much less permeable basement into which pressures could diffuse. And according to their calculations, it appears that Yes, indeed, the reach of the uh, increase in pressure uh, would, in fact, reach where the earthquakes were occurring uh, if the triggering pressure was something like about uh, 5 pascals, so 0.05 MPA, a pretty small number, but not inconsistent what had been seen in other, other areas. So this suggested very strongly that uh, not only was there a potential connection between these disposal activities, which were broadly elevating fluid pressures over a, a broad region, but also within a critically stressed crust, one in which a small perturbation was going to be sufficient to be able to nucleate earthquakes. So I'm showing an animation here that uh, Matt Weingarten has put together showing the pressure rate of increase uh, in the uh, basement. And, um, we're stepping through time, and you'll see some dots appearing here. These represent the earthquakes. Uh, the Prague earthquakes have just occurred in 2011. You see new areas coming on. Oh, now we're really getting to go. And you'll watch the seismicity follow. So I think once we were able to collect, rather painfully collect, the, uh, the systematic information on wastewater disposal and begin to integrate that with the seismicity, uh, the picture really became very clear. So here we are today, uh, we have regulations in place in Oklahoma that are mitigating this, and I'll talk in the end of my talk about what the effects of that may be on the hazard. But let's dig a little bit further into the science. So if we look broadly at this picture in, in, uh, in north central Oklahoma, uh, this is the uh, estimate of the pressure increases in the Arbuckle Formation, it goes up to about half of a megapascal uh, with a distribution of earthquakes. This is through about 2016. And I think you can see that there's, in general, a, a very uh, clear spatial correlation. But it does you know, make a certain amount of faith that is it possible that earthquakes at these larger distances, in fact, are being triggered uh, by pressure, act pressure or uh, potentially poor elastic effects. So to get a closer look at these earthquakes, uh, working with my colleague Martin Schoenball, we felt it was necessary to take a, a much closer look at the seismicity. And I, I apologize that uh, this slide is particularly difficult for anyone to see, even in the first row. So let me describe what we're looking at. The main point here are the little triangles that you can see. Maybe they're the one feature that survives uh, this projection system. These are the seismic stations that are available in Oklahoma to us. Most of these stations are stations that came from companies, not from publicly available stations. So really getting the buy-in and the cooperation of industry to, to tackle this problem was extremely important. And we're really grateful to those companies that were willing to share data with us. Um, I think all of this data is essentially now available on the, uh, at the IRIS DMC, and many of you have been mining it, I know. So what we wanted to do was something very simple. Rather than try to do a, a tremendous job of finding all the earthquakes, we said, let's at least begin with what's in the catalog and see what they can tell us about the seismicity if we do some reprocessing. So let's zoom in just a little bit to take a, an area in the center of the state. These are the catalog locations. They're not bad. I think you can get some clear indications of structures that can be seen uh, in these. But after reprocessing, uh, these sharpen up. And suddenly, we're able to see faults. And that was really a critical step by being able to go from clouds of earthquakes to now to begin to talk about individual fault structures that allows us now to begin to think about how does geomechanics enter, the, enter into this picture. I'll show you another example, in this case one from southern Kansas. Um, this is an area that uh, the USGS uh, installed a 14-station uh, network to, uh, to have enough stations really to be able to look at the earthquakes uh, in great detail. Uh, paper by Rubenstein and all has just recently been published in BSSA that describes the details. And one of the exciting things here is that if we zoom in on one of the clusters that looks kind of like a cloudy mess here in map view, it turns out that we're imaging normal faults really quite clearly. And I think you can see as this animation spins around and you get clear views here. 
it's clear that we're seeing uh, the interaction between normal faults. In this case, one normal fault is being clearly truncated by another one. So just as geology tells us, it should work. So we're looking at earthquakes in Oklahoma that are primarily strike-slip. We get into uh, southern Kansas, and there's now a mix of earthquake activity that is both strike-slip and normal faulting. So we might begin to ask, how does that relate to geomechanics? Well, to, to do this on a more systematic basis, we felt that with these data, we could do some clustering to identify individual, fault, uh, uh, individual faults. And by using an, an algorithm called dbscan, it was possible to find something like 300 faults that could be clearly characterized on the basis of their seismicity alignment. And when we compare those earthquakes with the focal mechanisms that Bob Herman has been cranking out at St. Louis University, the, remark the agreement is remarkable. And on average, we're just a few degrees off in terms of the nodal plane orientation and the orientation of the fault planes. So we're really gathering a tremendous amount of information which we can begin to compare directly with geomechanical predictions. One of the other things that we're very interested in is finding out where the earthquakes were occurring. And somewhat to our surprise, we found that all of the earthquakes for which we had confidence in the focal depths were in the basement. We essentially have no earthquakes that are occurring within the sedimentary section, perhaps a few within the Arbuckle. But in general, we're looking at earthquakes that are, at, at an average, something like four kilometers below the top of basement. So we're, we have to have a mechanism which is going to connect them with the fluid pressure. It's going to be necessary to propagate that fluid uh, pressure pulse uh, to great depth. And uh, this seems to be one of the interesting requirements. It might, as you can imagine, require some time to do that. And that will come uh, in a critical way uh, later in the talk when we begin to examine some of the, the models that are being proposed for the seismicity. Another thing that we could look at is, well, what, what are the orientations of these faults and how do they compare with what our expectations are based upon geomechanics? So on the, uh, the left here is a rose diagram showing the strikes of the earthquakes, uh, earthquake faults in Oklahoma. The colored picture here is uh, Yen, Jens Lundsny's uh, stress map for Oklahoma. The bars here indicate the orientation of SH max. On average, it has a east-west orientation or a little bit north of east. It's precisely what one would predict uh, for this class of faults, assuming a coefficient of friction of about 0.6. Furthermore, from his work, we know that the state of stress uh, in Oklahoma is appropriate for strike-slip faulting. Uh, the color is a little hard to see, but as we run into uh, the uh, Oklahoma-Kansas border and into Kansas, they become more normal faulting. So it's all beginning really to make sense that, that we can measure the state of stress uh, by using appropriate measurements in boreholes. That allows us to predict which class of faults will be active. Now, one of the surprises here is that none of these faults that are active appear on any of the fault maps for Oklahoma. The faults that are mapped, those in the sedimentary section, uh, are apparently not involved in this. And as you saw on the previous slide, um, it's because these faults are in the basement and the basement is not exposed. Now, I, I'm told by my uh, colleagues in Oklahoma, Brett Carpenter and Zev Rehas, that they have looked at some of the exposures of the basement in southern Oklahoma and the fault sets that they find are compatible with this picture. So it may be that uh, Oklahoma had the uh, unfortunate case of having a set of basement faults which were just properly aligned in terms of today's stress field. One other thing about the state of stress that I should mention is that you'd wonder um, what is the stressing rate in Oklahoma. That would be important for a number of models that are being considered. And so I asked Eric Calais, um, would it be possible to learn something about the, um, the strain rate in Oklahoma by looking at the geodetic data? So in a paper we published in The Leading Edge, he presented the results, which were that at the level of measurement position for GPS, Oklahoma is not straining. So setting the strain rate to zero or very close to zero has some kind of interesting implications for geomechanical models, but in a sense it frees us by saying that the principal change that's going on is from the industrial drivers. Another thing that turned out to be quite interesting about these earthquakes was the order in which they occurred. We found that the, the, the duration of sequences uh, had a long span, some of them a very short duration, others for a long time. But when we looked at when did the largest earthquake occur in any sequence, 
it turns out to be a random number. Um, either using a, a, a KS test or just simply looking at the histogram, we found that, that the earth type, the time that the main earthquake occurs is, is not at any particular time in the sequence, but perhaps more importantly, we found no sequence in which the first earthquake was the largest. In other words, Mother Nature was tipping her hand by producing small earthquakes as the fault became activated. And this is even with a very high level of magnitude completeness for our catalog, magnitude 2.8. I know that Rob Scamol and others are applying um, uh, template matching techniques to lower, greatly lower the magnitude threshold. And I think it's going to be really interesting to learn more about the activation of these sequences since we have hundreds of them now to look, about, look at, how they came from nothing uh, springing into being. When we look at the time of the main shock, uh, we do find a, trend, a tendency for earthquakes to begin to accelerate toward the ultimate failure. And on the left here, we have an inverse Omori uh, law diagram here. So this is the rate of earthquakes looking backwards, a uh, conventional Omori type plot here, which has a, about t to the minus 1, perhaps t to the minus 0.5 is the average behavior. And of course, these are averages. Individual sequences have more variability. So I think a lot of things that we have learned about the statistics of the sequences that really suggest that um, there was a lot of predictive information uh, that was encoded in the system. I want to take a, a minute to, to look at one of the uh, activations uh, in a little more detail. Uh, this is a rather worrisome set of earthquakes that were occurring uh, near the town of Guthrie and Langston in central Oklahoma. The map on the left here, the, the blue triangles here, uh, represent uh, large disposal wells that had their peak activity in about 2007 and 2008. Not so much uh, injection after that. The orange triangles, which more or less dot the rest of this, are, are um, disposal wells that began in something like 2013, 2014. So Matt Weingarten used these, uh, these data to develop a uh, hydrologic model uh, to simply look at how pressures were changing uh, in the Arbuckle Formation, shown here in red, and in the basement, shown here in blue. Time beginning in 1997, running to 2015. And what you see is that there's a very rapid rise in uh, pressure in the Arbuckle uh, once these wells begin to turn on, and then it more or less flattens out with a dip here. But basement pressures are rising pretty consistently throughout this entire period. So the basement is basically acting as a big shock absorber, Pressure is going to continue to diffuse there for a long time. The first earthquakes really didn't begin until quite late in this process. And when they did, they activated uh, a single well-oriented fault in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the basement. This is what that fault looks like. Again, it's almost perfectly aligned within the stress field. Moment tensors from Bob Herman here really confirm the orientation of the fault. And then over time, uh, this blossomed into a whole sequence of small to intermediate length faults. I guess we were lucky that they didn't link up and produce a single earthquake. But this activity then dribbled on for a period of, uh, of, of about two years and eventually uh, involved a dozen faults within this area. This is very typical of what we have seen. So there's some suggestion that once a, an event begins to find a, once a, the pressure finds a pathway to depth where it can nucleate a sequence, there can not only be additional nucleations from more pressure diffusion, but also probably earthquake to earthquake interaction. Both are probably important processes. So some of the key points to take away here from wastewater and induced earthquakes are the rapid migration of pressure over large distances through this very permeable um, arbuckle formation, and then eventual diffusion of that pressure into the basement. Uh, where faults that are well-oriented in the contemporary stress field are encountered, we can nucleate earthquakes with only a small pressure change, uh, perhaps tens of kilopascal or even a bit smaller. Um, mapping faults would be great, but it turned out not to be very useful predictor, predictor, at least in Oklahoma. And again, all of these sequences that we can study in detail start with smaller earthquakes before the larger earthquakes of concern occurred. Well, what about the strength of the earthquakes? Uh, this was, again, one of the big questions that we had because there had been some um, speculations put forth based upon the shaking intensity of the earthquakes that perhaps they weren't as strong as tectonic earthquakes. So as part of the work that I was doing at the US Geological Survey with many colleagues, um, we were kind of ambulance chasers running around to places where 
uh, moderate-sized earthquakes that occurred to get additional stations out in the hope that we would record some strong motions, and we did. Uh, I'm showing you an example here from the magnitude 5 earthquake that occurred uh, near Cushing, Oklahoma in, uh, 2000, uh, in 2016. Uh, you can't read the scale, but um, the horizontal accelerations here exceed a half a G, and the duration of the strong motion is about three seconds. Those are big enough numbers that engineers get concerned, and certainly in an area in which many of the buildings are one or two story unreinforced masonry buildings. So they, they suffered a tremendous damage in Cushing. Well, looking at these earthquakes as a whole, uh, working with Yihe Wong, uh, Greg Barroza and I decided let's look at as many of these earthquakes as we can to see if we can under something, understand something about their stress drops. So where we had empirical greens functions, we were able to measure uh, not only the, the stress drop of induced earthquakes, but also tectonic earthquakes in the same area. And when we looked at the central United States, the black, um, uh, the black symbols here represent the induced earthquakes, the blue symbols, the tectonic earthquakes. The main difference was that the, the tectonic earthquakes are deeper. And if we think about our Andersonian stress model, so we're plotting uh, logarithmic stress in this direction, linear depth, um, they basically follow the same trajectories as the tectonic earthquakes. So we don't see any reason to think that tectonic earthquakes and, and induced earthquakes are any different once they're started. So what we're doing with induced earthquakes is we're triggering an event to occur. Where that event goes, we don't know. But when it does rupture, it's going to be just as strong as a tectonic earthquake. If anything, we found that there is a difference with eastern earthquakes where they do seem to be higher stress drop. And I know that some people are now reevaluating their ground motion prediction equations to see if there really are differences between the central and eastern United States. Um, the graph on the right just simply here compares um, the data that we collected for earthquakes between four and four and a half, these are the peak ground accelerations, with Gail Atkinson's model for California. And again, sitting close to the earthquakes, you get a pretty good ride. There's no question that these earthquakes are strong if you're in close. So that allows us now to begin to look at what the shaking hazard is from these earthquakes. Uh, we need to know something about the rate of earthquake activity and the way in which ground motions are transmitted uh, once the earthquake occurs. So working, uh, Mark Peterson's group at the National Seismic Hazard Project uh, took this on very seriously after some uh, very um, helpful conversations with many of the stakeholders, those in state government, uh, those in industry. People wanted to know what is the effect of these earthquakes and how long will we have to deal with them. So beginning in 2016, uh, the U.S. has produced a series of one-year hazard maps that have looked to de define areas in which the uh, uh, strong shaking could be expected within that year, and many different products that express that. We're looking here at the current map, 2018, and I think you can see here from the colors that the central Oklahoma area, according to this methodology, is really comparable to the hottest spots in California. So we're certainly not out of the woods yet. <clears throat> but a, an important question is, what happens in the future? These maps have been made on the assumption that the number of earthquakes this coming year will be the same as the number of earthquakes last year. And earthquake activity in the area is declining. We're down by about uh, a factor of three from the peak in 20, uh, 2015. So a very good question to ask is what happens in the future. And to me, this is really the place that we have been moving as a community all along with understanding the earthquake activity that's related to oil and gas that um, when we're doing individual studies, we're kind of doing stamp collecting, we're, we're being able to figure out how things worked in the past, but to do science, we really need to be able to make some predictions about what happens. And to do that is, again, required a, a huge community effort to gather the information about where injection has been occurring, uh, what the mechanical properties of the system are, and to go forward to make up some predictions. And I'm gonna show you a couple of different models that have been put out there today. Um, the three I'm going to show here were all discussed in this morning's session on induced seismicity, and I was pleased to see a fourth model also that I'm unable to include here. So th the basic story uh, can be seen here by the uh, curve in gray, which, is, which I'll trace here, it's hard to see. This is the injection into the Arbuckle. Um, it was going on for many years. Uh, and uh, peaked in about 2013 or 2014, and then came down as a, thing, as a consequence of regulation, and it might continue, say, at this level in the future. 
the green curve here, uh, which you can see is shifted in time, represents the earthquake rate. So there is this lag in the system between uh, when the fluid pressure is induced into the Arbuckle before it, perme before it permeates to, to depth, and the red curve here represents a model which accounts for that, uh, per that, for that transmission of the, of the fluid pressure into the basement. So these are the types of data that people have been working with to build models. Um, so it's difficult to make predictions about the future. Somebody said that, we're never quite sure who it was, but I think that's our job here, to really say how can we make informed predictions about what will happen. Um, I remember a few years ago, several of us were visiting with, a, uh, with one of the regulators of the oil industry, not in Oklahoma, but in, in another state where um, uh, the oil industry is an important. And uh, the regulator, I would say, was beginning to come to terms with the science. Um, he said to me that, he said, you know, the science that you guys are doing is really beginning to make a lot of sense. He said, I'm sure glad it's not like climate change, where for every paper that says it's real, there's another paper that says it's not. So we do have some work to do in terms of our science communication. And uh, I'm happy to say that in that state, they are beginning to come around. They certainly came around in Oklahoma, and that was, again, part of a really concerted effort to educate those in state government about what's going on, and that included everyone from the governor on down uh, in terms of uh, intensive briefing by numbers of our colleagues. So they did get it. So here are a couple of models that have been put forward recently. Uh, the one on the left is one by Long Longenbrook and Zoback, uh, and uh, this, the one on the right here is by uh, Thomas Goebbels and his uh, colleagues here. Again, looking at much of the same data using different methods, coming with somewhat different predictions. And I think this is really good because we're actually able to do things in a prospective way uh, by going into the future. Another example here is from uh, work that Jack Norbeck and Justin Rubenstein recently published. Uh, they've developed a hydromechanical model in which they account for the diffusion of pore pressure, and then they've coupled that to a rate and state model, uh, which allows them to make a forecast of earthquake activity. And as Justin explained in his talk today, they don't have many free parameters in their model, and those free parameters are the kind of things that you can pull from the literature. So if you look at their predictions here, this only goes through 2016. Uh, at least with this period of time, they are making uh, some rather remarkably accurate forecasts. So I think this is the direction we will be going. An another model which uh, Cornelius presented this morning was uh, an adaption of the seismogenic index model, uh, which requires some calibration. So in this case, uh, it's a recognition that you can put the same amount of fluid into the ground one place and nothing happens and you put it in another place and a lot goes on. So how do you calibrate that model? And you do it empirically. So this, this particular model is one that was just recently published and this just shows the, uh, the colors here represent the calibrations, the sensitivity of the crust uh, for producing earthquakes uh, to the change in, in port pressure. And there's about a two order of uh, magnitude difference here in the scale here. So some of these deep blue areas produce one earthquake for a unit of pore pressure change where some of the yellow areas here produce 100. So understanding in a more fundamental way about how we might be able to identify the areas that are really sensitive I think is one of the keys that we should be trying to solve going forward. So just to look at this model a little bit to show you, give you a flavor for how it's done, and here again is the earthquake rate activity uh, in Oklahoma. The yellow curve, which probably is not visible beyond the second row, is uh, the uh, calibration based on data through 2011, so long before things start, start up. So it looks like it's possible to use a small, small amount of data to get a good calibration. Uh, here's a broader set of calibration going forward in which more of the data is used, and basically you get the same answer. Um, and here are the predictions which are published in their paper. These are retrospective predictions here. Starting in 2018, it's going forward. And if injection continues at the rate that it has from 2017, we are going to be seeing a decline in earthquake activity in Oklahoma. And so one question that can be asked is, how might you modify injection to eliminate some of these bright orange spots? Well, even with all of these changes, Oklahomans are going to have to live with a higher level of seismicity for some time to, to come. These are curves here that show the annual exceedance probability is a percent from 1 to 100 versus earthquake magnitude. The curve over here on the left is the tectonic background, and you can see that we have shifted these curves way to the right, particularly for the most active period. Uh, 
They are falling in this direction, but according to several models, it's going to be a decade or more before we get anywhere close to background. So there's still more to do. So I want to leave you with a few thoughts. Um, one is that it's clear that the types of regulatory changes that have been made, uh, specifically in Oklahoma, but I think the examples go to many other states as well, are reducing the short-term hazard from induced earthquakes. And uh, it's declining in Oklahoma specifically because we're injecting less water into the Arbuckle. The industry has found other places to put the water that doesn't go into the basement, as well as is cutting back on injection. So a good question might be, what might the predictions be in some of the other areas that are starting to come online in a big way, such as the Delaware Basin in West Texas that I mentioned earlier? This hazard is high, and it is going to be comparable to the natural hazard for years to come. And so one of the questions for our engineering colleagues would be, I think, to ask them, what are the prudent steps that we might take to reduce the risk? And finally, I think we're at the stage now where we're going to be able to do prospective tests of these models. And really, uh, I think that's going to be fundamental uh, in terms of moving forward to, to us to really understand what are the physical elements in our models that are going to be necessary to make accurate predictions of the future. With that, I'll thank you for your attention and would be happy to answer any questions you have. Yeah, so to repeat the question, Bartha asked uh, two questions. One is, can we take this understanding that we have for induced seismicity and turn it into something that will be helpful in terms of, of natural tectonic earthquakes? And then the second part was, what might the recommendations that we would make for this, I think, for other communities such as engineers? I, th I think the first part is, is we're, I think we're beginning to learn things about earthquake mechanics that we haven't had access to before. Um, it's difficult to do experiments in the earth. And we're, in a sense, fortunate that some of those experiments are being done for us. There are still critical things that we don't know. So I showed you some really kind of elegant calculations about pressures in the area where the earthquakes are going. Those are model estimates. We don't have direct measurements at this point. I think those are the things that we really need to understand. We have good estimates as to what the state of stress is, but I, I think it would be really very valuable for us to know much more about that. So I, I think we still have some steps to go before we can turn this into an understanding for natural earthquakes. For me, as I think about, say, the earthquakes that I'm familiar with in, Oklahoma, in, in California, uh, many of them start with a boom. Okay, there's nothing that precedes them. Uh, Loma Prieta, for example, had no earthquakes anywhere near the hypocenter for at least the 20 years that we have high-quality data. It just, it just happened. So I, I think making all the connections at this point may be difficult, but I think the opportunity by studying these earthquakes is to learn more about the nucleation process. And I think that's an important area that connects both tectonic and natural earthquakes. As far as the, as far as the engineering issues, I think it, it it suggests that there will be ways to mitigate the seismicity once we identify it, particularly if, as Cornelius Langenbrook's work suggests, there's some areas that are more sensitive than others. If you see a sensitive area, that's probably one to figure out how to avoid before things get out of hand. Rick. Yeah, so Rick is asking about the, the Prague earthquake, uh, which was the first of the large earthquakes in Oklahoma. This was a magnitude 5.7. And again, it was, uh, it was near some large high volume disposal wells. Uh, so I think that the, the, the triggering of that earthquake by, you know, by fluid pressure is really not out of the realm. I think that one of the big questions that we're still struggling with is what is the relationship between the industrial activity and the potential magnitudes of earthquakes. And there are a number of models that are out there. Um, uh, 
I, I think what we have seen is that there is the possibility for runaways that uh, really we're releasing tectonic stress. That's one thing I probably should have, have emphasized that is probably clear to all of you anyway, but these earthquakes are releasing tectonic stress. They're not releasing stress that we're putting in through the industrial process. And what, what the industrial process is doing is providing the trigger. Um, most of these well-oriented faults in, Cal in Oklahoma appear to be pretty short. That's good because <laughs> the magnitudes aren't so big, but occasionally you hit one like Prague or the Pawnee earthquake and they get larger. Uh, fortunately, nothing larger than that at this point. But that, I think, you know, brings back the other question about prospectively, can we identify faults that would be hazardous on the basis of their orientation and their dimension? And, and I know that in the, uh, the Permian Basin in, in Texas, this is an area that's of, of considerable concern because we don't know much about the faults, but there could be large ones out there, and are they dangerous or not? Um, you want to moderate your uh, yeah, yeah, okay. Down here. Yeah. Uh, do you have a high resolution seismic image subscope? Yeah. That you can correlate your seismicity with the structure. Yeah. Yeah, so a great question about what do we know about the subsurface? That um, all of these oil areas are ones in which there are great 3D seismic surveys today. Uh, unfortunately, they rarely look into the basement. And when they look into the basement, it's extremely difficult to find faults, particularly uh, vertical strike slip faults are very, very hard to image. So this is, a, again, a big challenge for our, our colleagues who do seismic imaging to see is there a, a better way that we can identify uh, fault structures before we, uh, we find them by making earthquakes. So the question is about uh, identifying faults in Oklahoma, and there's been some interesting work done, done using aeromagnetic data. Um, it certainly indis indicates general families of faults, but the aeromag data is not precise enough yet to identify individual structures and not to identify the key issue about how long the faults are. I mean, we've seen short faults to date, and the question is, are some of these longer structures ones that might be activated? If they're real, we should be concerned about them. If they're not, then we probably don't need to worry. So there's more to more work to be done. Kellen. Yeah, I mean, many similar operations in North America. In other places, we did not reduce as much uh, as Oklahoma. Why is Oklahoma uh, different? Yeah, so, so Kellen's question is, what makes Oklahoma so different? So if we look at the, if we look at the Bakken in North Dakota, for example, this is again a, a major uh, shale play in which they're injecting a lot of water. There really aren't any earthquakes at all. And uh, my understanding is in part that's likely because the injection is at shallower levels than production. So it isn't reaching basement. And it may also be that the stress is not as critical. But that's a hypothesis. These are things that we need to test. I think there are many open questions that we have. And again, what we would really like to have is a predictive understanding where you could go to an area before there's any development and say, it's likely that earthquakes are going to be a problem because stresses are high and faults are present, or this looks like a reasonably benign area. We can go ahead until we see a reason to be concerned. So we have a lot to do. Back there near the wall. Yeah, so the question is about what about the long-term history of, of Oklahoma earthquakes and could they all be uh, induced? Um, I know of an earth, because I had to study Oklahoma history as a child, I know there was an earthquake in 1889. <laughs> so perhaps that helps answer the question in part, but it certainly is possible that much of that kind of one per year magnitude three earthquake activity, many of those could be related to oil and gas activities, but it's gonna be very hard to sort out. Clearly the change is by orders of magnitude, uh, even if the older activity was uh, somehow related to industri industrial operations. In the front row here. Yeah, so good question. This regards the, the fault networks that I was showing. And the question was, as the deformation 
proceeds is there the potential for uh, faults to link up to make larger, uh, larger faults, uh, larger sources. Uh, certainly it's possible. Uh, what we've seen in general though is that there's, uh, there's branching perhaps from one structure to another, but one structure sort of dies out uh, before the next one starts up or it dies out as the second one is starting up. We haven't seen um, clear examples that I can think of of multiple structures running along. Perhaps a little bit of that on the Prague earthquake, but uh, generally not as, not as common. Lynn. Is Lynn. My impression is that a lot of the earthquakes that are induced are due to the injection of high volumes of water, of, of waste produced by fracking. Uh, so you have the possibility that you can send it to some other place that's not as your impression that also in Oklahoma that most of the earthquakes are caused by the injection of wastewater? Yeah, so Lynn's asking about the, the wastewater balance. Is there something that we can do to reduce it? So in Oklahoma, almost all the wastewater is actually produced water. The, the fracking water is a small volume but it's mostly the stuff that you have to get out of the ground to get a barrel of oil. In fact, some of these wells, when they start, they might get 40 or 50 barrels of wastewater before they get a barrel of oil. So it's a, it's a really bad balance. It's not as bad in some other areas, and I, I know of at least one company that is in the, in the development of their assets in Texas are building a, a system to do fracking with wastewater so that they end up injecting as little as possible. So I think that there's thinking in the industry about how they can begin to, to minimize the amount of fluid that they are injecting. Uh, I've also heard of other companies that are short of water in the scoop and stack in Oklahoma where they're fracking now and they're, they're using wastewater there as well. So there are things to do with the wastewater uh, besides just simply putting it into the Arbuckle. David. Yeah, so, so David's asking, what was special about Oklahoma? Is it related to the, the, the geology and the industrial processes or something about the regulatory environment? Uh, clearly, the, the economy in Oklahoma depends heavily on oil, so they're cautious to do anything. But I think once they understood the problem, they, they began to take reasonable steps. And for them, the challenge was that the, uh, the formations are so wet, they produce so much water, they had to have a way of getting rid of it. And until something, an alternative to disposal by deep injection is found, they're sort of stuck with that. So the decision was made to dial back on injection, which is also dialing back on the economy. So very, very tough choice to make. Okay, okay I think uh, that's uh, it for this session. I would like to thank uh, Bill one more time, and thank you all for coming. That was great. Yeah. I grew up in Tulsa.